Hey, y'all, and welcome back to another episode of the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. My name is Jesse, and I'll be your host. Now, on today's episode, we're going to cover a little movie outside of the realm of the United States. We're going to cover uh, a little film. It's a horror film. Um, kind of, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a weird little film, uh, but I deeply enjoy it, and I think it's such a, a great little movie, and, um, you know, I, I really like it. We're going to be covering Audition today from 1999 by Takashi Miike. Now, this movie, my history with this film is... So back in my day, back in the 2000s, there was um, the Bravo channel before it became, you know, the central uh, piece of the Real Housewives franchise. Um, And also Andy Cohen being a horrible person and being a messy gay. Anyway, but uh, it used and you know, back in the day, though, it had like inside the actor's studio uh, and then it had like, you know... Kathy Griffin stand up, I guess, and like just like a mix match of like different things, kind of. Um, and one of the things that they had for some reason was in the October time, the spooky time, um, in like 2004 or something like that, they had Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments, which then had like two little uh, spin offs which was 30 even scarier movie moments. And then there was like a 13 even scarier movie moments or whatever the hell. Anyway, but this little thing had a chokehold on me. Okay. Because I was like thinking like 12 years old or something. Right. And I loved horror. So of course this was like, it's kind of a great list to go off of because I really do think a lot of people in my, my day, people who are my age or maybe a little older or whatever, um, but who were getting into horror, I think this was a really cool uh, piece of media because it gave you a hundred fucking movies to like go out and try to find and watch. Like, that was so cool. And Audition was one of them. And of course, like Eli Roth, like nutted on the screen while he was fucking talking about it. Cause needless to say, I think, um, Eli Roth was definitely influenced by someone like a Takashi Miike. Um, he went on and on about how wonderful Audition was and everything like that when on the program. But anyway, uh, and that was, when I first became aware of it, I guess. And then it wasn't until years later where I think it was on Tubi or Shutter or something like that. I think I'm trying to remember if I had ads on it, but it doesn't really matter at this point. But like, I, I just remember being like, Oh, you know what? Let me pull up on this. Let me go and watch it. I actually just watched it on Canopy. Uh, if you don't know about Canopy, please pull up on Canopy if you have a library card. Um, if you don't have a library card, hopefully go get one. It's free. And then, depending on if your local library participates in Canopy, uh, it's kind of lit over at Canopy, honestly. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. But anyway, um, enough about Canopy, though. But, like, uh, but yeah, no, Audition, it, it was just... Yeah, I, I watched it and I just really enjoy it. Like it's it does such a movie that like it it starts off as one thing you think it's gonna be and then it completely subverts what you think it'll be. Cause it doesn't start off as a horror film, really. And we'll talk about that. But like it's just such a good movie and I think it um yeah, I think I want people to talk about it and, you know, I want it to be out there. You know, it's not maybe for everybody. I, I, w- I do have some little bit of criticism, mostly with the runtime. I don't think it needs to be almost two hours. Um, Takashi Miike has a bit of a bad habit of making long movies um, when maybe they don't need to be all that long, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I just really do generally like this movie. And I think for any horror fan, it, it's just a good watch to have just to see if you like it or not I guess Um, because again it's not going to be for everybody but I do think like it is something where and especially if you're into Japanese horror at all I definitely think that it's a good uh, thing to watch as well because you know it like I said it starts off one way and then it ends up completely being a horror film but it doesn't start off like that so I, I just really you know I want to talk about it and you know celebrating 25 years you know it's 
turn it you know and that's so cool and you know makes me feel old of course but like yeah why not but as normally we do on the show we're gonna talk a little bit about the production history um you know how did this movie release what happened all that good stuff talk about the plot character breakdown all that cool fun shit but with uh, further ado, let's get to figures of the movie. So this film was uh, made its premiere um, October 2nd of 1999 uh, at the Vancouver International Film Festival. And then it had, uh, I guess, a release in Japan March 3rd of 2000. So again, it did premiere in 1999. Maybe it would make sense for me to do this in October, but fuck it, we're doing it now. Um, and then this movie uh, was... Uh, I don't even know where it was distributed, but the production companies were Omega Project um, and like a bunch of different like uh, the production companies and stuff. Uh, I can't also find a budget on this movie, too, but I would be shocked if it was like a higher high budget or anything like that. But I don't have any budget information, unfortunately. Um, I do have a little bit of box office information, Um, but this movie also clocks in at about 113 minutes. And of course, this is a Japanese production um, as well. Um, so a little bit about just uh, some of the figures of the film. So in terms of box office, I'm pulling it up right now. So let's see. Let's look at the original release. So I don't think I have anything for like opening weekend or anything that I can find at least um, because this didn't actually release until about 2001 in the States. Um And even, like, in Japan, I'm not really finding a whole lot for that, which is just odd. Um, But, anyway, needless to say, though, um, so the domestic uh, box office for this was about $131,296. International was about $228,557. So we're looking at, like, around $350,853 altogether, at least according to Box Office Mojo. Um, But, yeah, so this movie you know it released in uh even in japan it didn't release until 2000 there's all that the general consensus i guess at least on something like letterbox so i'm gonna look at my letterbox real quick so audition has about a 3.8 out of five on letterbox of the voice of the people we then also have like on rotten tomatoes as well so with rotten tomatoes we have 83 percent on the tomato meter out of 84 reviews and then an 80 percent audience score with about 50,000 ratings uh the critics consensus for this film is uh an audacious unsettling japanese horror film from grizz from uh director takashi Miike. audition entertains as both a grisly shocker and a uh psychological drama So that's kind of like the critic consensus of this film. So yeah, that's a little bit about that. Um, And so I guess we can get into like just some of the key players of this film um, and, you know, people behind it. So our director of the film is, as I stated already, Takashi Miike. Um, He's done quite a bit. Um, He was born in 1960, so he is about 64 at this time now, Uh, probably 63 at this point. But Yeah, he has uh, done a whole lot of different things. He's done, like, really violent stuff and bizarre stuff, but also he's done, like, you know, the Yakuza movies, like the Japanese gangster movies. He's also done some family-friendly work. So it's really interesting how he's kind of had this, like, weird career, but um, he's kind of a, from what I gather, sort of a um, a worker for hire, if anything, a director for hire, especially. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of him. For those uh, who are wondering, I guess, um, so he did a lot of direct-to-video stuff as well, um, but feature film-wise, he did um, one of the things he did was Visitor Q. That's a really fucking weird movie. Um, it's very black comedy but yeah it's a tough watch i've only watched parts of that and it's not exactly the easiest thing um but i would say most people know him for this movie he also did the movie dead or alive which was actually screened on the last drive-in um i believe as well along with audition if i'm not mistaken but yeah 
He also did Ishii the Killer, who we'll tie that back to our, um, we'll tie that back a little bit. Um, and he also did actually another film that I kind of enjoyed, uh, was The Happiness of the Catacories. Um, that was kind of fun. Uh, it's like a weird, bizarre musical about a family that lives at the base of a volcano in Japan. Um, and so he also did, um, he also did One Missed Call, not the really bad remake from the 2000s, but he did the early 2000s Japanese one, which I have not actually watched all the way through, but I probably should because I've tried to watch it like two times and I've always, you know, not made it. So I'm, I'm going to do that. Oh, and he also was involved in one of the three extreme um, movies. Uh, so for those who don't know, three extremes is uh, a collection of shorts that were made by uh, Asian filmmakers like Asian horror filmmakers and he did the one that was called Box um, and it's a really cool movie actually I watched it a long long time ago um, I feel like I watched it recently too but maybe I need to get around to watching it again it's a really interesting film um, go check it out if you haven't already done so uh, if you're at all interested in J-horror but yeah Takashi Miike he's that guy <laughs> um, but yeah you know this is uh kind of it's not his only directorial effort but i think it's a lot of uh what a lot of people know him for in terms of his first one if anything um the screenplay was and y'all already know when it comes to these japanese names go listen to the perfect blue episode uh some of them are you know kicking my ass every now and then um but we have uh Daisuko uh, Tengen, I guess, is the name of the screenplay writer. Uh, so, uh, but this was uh, based off of a book uh, by Ryu uh, Murakami. Uh, so that was who wrote the book based, uh, you know, that was this movie got based off of. And so, uh, movie was also produced by uh, Satoshi Fukushima, and then also Akemi uh, Suyama. And let me see if I can find anybody of note or anybody in particular we could talk about in terms of the crew. Um, so let's look. At the, let's see a composer. So composer is uh, Koji Endo. He seems to have worked with uh, Takashi Miike on a couple of his projects. So he did like Thirteen Assassins, which was another movie he did. Um, so really, I think Ko, uh, Koji seems like his like kind of composer for hire. Uh, but he's done a lot of stuff with him. Um, It looks like also um, this uh, Tengen guy uh, who did the screenplay. He has also worked uh, with Takashi Mika and a couple other things as well. Um, so it looks like they, they, they it seems like they're buds, uh, which is cool. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and it looks like the producers of this movie have gone on and done some other Japanese projects as well, uh, which is cool. They did one of the Juwan movies, one of the later movies in the Juwan series, but um, that was kind of cool. Or at least uh, Satoshi Fukushima did as well. Let's look at the cinematographer. Let's see what he did. Uh, Hideo uh, Yamamoto, um, he actually was the... So he's worked with Takashi Miike in a couple of things, but he also did... So he did Ichi the Killer. He did this movie. He also did the grudge as well um and he's done other takashi Miike movies like i said um so that is that and then production designer uh tetsuo uh, ozeki again he's kind of done some different things as well uh, mostly he did this movie uh one of the later juan movies um one of the other guys worked on and a couple other little japanese films as well just like random ones but this wasn't a big it wasn't a big crew either so you know can only talk so much about like the crew i guess when you're talking about a movie that was a little bit i think of a lower budget honestly um when it came to this we gotta talk about this cast though so we have our kind of main characters um ayoyama uh is played by rio ishibashi i believe um this guy he is in the grudge remake with sarah michelle geller um he plays like uh i don't have to actually see that movie but i'm assuming he plays one of the asian people that's in the movie <laughs> since it's about her you know it's about american going to japan so it's, he's one of the asian people who was in it um he's also in the movie suicide club as well um also in that film and let's see what else he was in. 
Yeah, I mean, those were like the big things, you know, but he's he's been in a lot of different Japanese movies as well, though, so that's kind of cool. Um, but he would have probably been a recognizable face, honestly, because, um, like I said, he was in the Grudge movies, um, both Grudge and Grudge 2, um, and all of that. We then have... Uh, Asami, who is our main lady in this movie, played by um, Ihi Shina. Uh, so this is kind of her big thing, but she was also in like Tokyo Gore Police, which that just sounds like a fun movie. All right. But she has done a bunch of, um, she's done a bunch of different Japanese films, so probably Japanese genre films, but most people know her as Asami. So uh, we then have uh, June Kunimura. Uh, so they are uh, Yoshikawa, who is his friend. Um, so this guy, um, he is. Um, so he's in Kill Bill. Um, he is the guy who Lucilu uh, decapitates um, after he uses her Asian and American, like, uh, kind of, what is it? Whether she's Chinese or Japanese or whatever, he like calls that into question. She like fucking cuts his head off. It's kind of great actually. Um, but, oh, it's so good. But yeah, so that's him. Um, (laughs) so that's what a lot of people know him for at least. But, uh, yeah, you know, you don't, you don't fuck with, you don't fuck with Lucy Liu, I guess, really. Um, he was actually just recently in The Boy Oi and His Heron. He's been in a couple little, um, he's been at least uh, two, was this a Miyazaki movie? Yes, it was. He's in at least two different Miyazaki movies, which is cool. Um, he's also in Ishi the Killer because he is literally, well, he's not Ishi, but he's like, you know, in there somewhere, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and what else is he in? Let's just look. Hmm. Oh, he's in Shin Godzilla. That's fun. Recent thing. He was also in The Wailing as well, which is, I think, a Korean horror film. Uh, I have not seen that, actually. But, yeah, he's in there as well. Yeah, so that's kind of the big things that, uh, you know, June has been up to. Um, Boss Tanaka is who I was thinking of. That's his name. But, yeah, he's... Uh, kind of iconic honestly uh, um so we have them uh Aoyama uh is the other one um I'm trying to remember who that is but he is been in a couple of things I'm trying to remember who everybody is it's so hard to like keep it all together oh sorry Shige that's who it is um so Got Ayoyama, Shige is his son. I always have to remember how Japanese people have their names too, because it's always like the the like the first name comes last or whatever the hell, so it's a whole thing. But yeah. And then you have like just some other uh folks as well. So like, you know, Shimada. I'm trying to remember who that is. He must be he's probably like the creepy ass guy, honestly, in here. But we'll we'll get into all that. But yeah, I mean, there's not anything to like really go into. The big people you need to know about are really um, Aoyama, who is the main dude in this movie, Asami, who is the lady in this movie, Yoshikawa, you kind of need to know who he is as well, Shige, who is his son, um, who is Aoyama's son, um, and maybe that's kind of really it. I don't think there's a need to know a bunch of the other people, um, but we'll come across those people though, but that's the cast of the movie and, you know, talked about that, but let's talk a little bit about how this uh, film came to be. So audition was originally a project of the Japanese company Omega Pitch project, um, who wanted to make a horror film, um, after the great financial success of their previous production, a little movie called ring or, uh, Ringu. So to create the film, um, the company purchased the rights to Murakami's book, and they hired the screenwriter, um, Dasuko uh, Tengen, and also the director, Takashi Miike, um, to film an adaptation of the book. So the cast and the crew consisted primarily of people that uh, Miike had already worked with um, on previous projects, with the exception of uh, Shina, um, who is uh, Asami in the movie, uh, who had worked as a model prior to her film career. And this was about uh, shot in about three weeks in Tokyo. 
So, uh, Audition premiered with a few other Japanese horror films at VIFF, which is Vancouver International Film Festival, um, and it got a lot more attention when it uh, was shown at Rotterdam International Film Festival in 2000, and following a theatrical release in Japan, it continued to play in festivals and also had theatrical releases in the United States and the UK, and also had several home media releases as well. Um, this movie has gone on to be on a lot of different uh, lists of the best horror films. It's definitely had an influence on people like Mr. Eli Roth and also the Soska sisters. Um, go watch American Mary, which you could probably find on Tubi or something. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. (laughs) But yeah, so there's a little bit of that. So, um, Omega, like we were saying, um, was behind the production um, of Hideo uh, Nitaka's film, Ring. Um, And this was a great success. And then um, in Japan, but then spread throughout Asia. And Omega had problems setting up the release of Ring in Korea and had the company AFDF Korea work on an actual Korean re-adaptation of Ring. Um, And so, yeah, they partnered... um, so the following year in 1998, after the release of Ring, um, Omega partnered again with AFDF Korea and other production companies, including creators company Connection, Film Face, and Body Sonic, to make this adaptation um, of audition so omega wanted to create a film different from the supernatural role themed ring and chose to uh, adapt this novel um, which lacked this trait so to, to attempt something different they hired the screenwriter and the director who was not known on working on horror films um and prior to audition um he was uh the screenwriter was most well known for actually having worked with his father on a movie called the eel, um, which actually won like, the main award at Cannes in 1997. So to create audition though, Takashi Miike worked with many of his previous collaborators like, um, Hideo, uh, Yamamoto. Um, Miike spoke of his cinematographer by saying that Yamamoto was quote, very sensitive towards death. Both of his parents died very young and it's not something he talks about much. Um, Miike also noted that he felt that Yamamoto was living in fear and that sensibility came through in his work. Um, it's something that I want to make the most of. Um, the film score was made by Koji Endo. He had worked on some of Mike's stuff as well. And uh, Ryo uh, Ishibashi uh, wanted to work with Mike and agreed to the lead role of Aoyama. Um, he commented that despite not being a great fan of horror films, he enjoyed scripts um, such as that of Audition, which showcased human nature. Um, and then Aihi Shina um, was cast as Asami. Shina's career was primarily as a model, and she'd only begin acting after being offered um, a film role while she was on holiday. Um, and she first learned about Mike through his film Blue Harps, which made her interested in wanting to meet the director. Um, and when Sheena first um, met Mike, um, they began talking about her opinions on love and relationships. And on their second meeting, Mike actually asked her to play the role of Asami. And Sheena thought that the uh, opinions and feelings that she expressed to Mike were the reasons she was cast in the role, and that she tried to play the role as naturally as she could without going over the top, um, which I think she she does beautifully here. So with a little bit of the production of the movie, so again, it was shot in about three weeks' time, um, which is about one more week than usual for Mike of his films at the time. Um, scenes uh, such as those that were at Asami's apartment or at the restaurant uh, were actually shot on location in a real apartment and a real restaurant. Um, and a lot of these outdoor scenes were shot in Tokyo along um, intersections of Omesando, which I guess is a part of Tokyo. So the torture scene at the end of this movie did not initially contain uh, Asami's lines of uh, kitty, 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 kitty. Um, Sheena was intentionally uh, whispering initially she was whispering uh, her lines when filming the scene but after discussion with Mike she decided uh, and they decided that having her say these lines like out loud would actually make the scene more scary um, and Ishibashi actually found that Mike was uh, quote having so much fun with that scene and that Mike was especially excited when um, 
Aoyama's uh, foot got cut off. We'll get to it. Um, but for the special effects where um, uh, Asami uh, places acupuncture needles into Ishibashi um, or into Aoyama, um, special effects makeup was used to create a mask layer, which was laid uh, upon uh, Aoyama's eyes, which are then pierced by the needles. So yeah, looks like Takashi Miike had a fun time with this. I would also say I didn't end up watching it because I didn't have time to really before I was going to record this episode. But I will say I don't think Audition is on Shutter right now. But if you do have a Shutter subscription, because I was watching some of it, I might watch it afterward, maybe. Um, but <laughs> but what I will say is that uh, the last drive-in, like I said, did this movie along with Dead or Alive, um, and so I would definitely recommend doing the Just Joe Bob. If you don't already know this, uh, if you go on Shutter, uh, there is something for Just Joe Bob where. Um, as you may or may not know, if you don't know, I, I don't know how you don't, but whatever. Um, the last drive in on shutter, it's, uh, Joe Bob Briggs and Darcy, the male girl and all these people, uh, they watch a movie and then every so often, um, they kind of cut back to, to Joe Bob and Darcy talking about the movie. Uh, Joe Bob gives us all this info, fun information, like background information and all that good shit. Well, they have it where, uh, if you don't feel like watching the movie proper, you can also just watch like the interstitial really um which i think are so fun to watch personally because i don't always want to be watching a movie all the time you know what i mean i got this podcast like I, I don't have the time to be watching a bunch of movies all the time right i got things to do so sometimes i like you know where i could just watch kind of the little interstitial things i think those are so fun and they do have one for audition so i would definitely recommend watch I, it's probably a lot of the same information that's already out there but i like when joe bob kind of puts his own little joe bob thing on it so i I enjoy that but anyway back to what we were saying so that was a little bit of production stuff uh but let's talk about the release of the film so as i stated this was premiered uh in vancouver um this was actually a premiere of uh a bunch of things so actually it is where um ring and ring 2 actually uh premiered so the initial Japanese films of The Ring were actually also premiered at the same um, festival, which is cool. Um, so this was released theatrically in Japan um, in March 3rd of 2000. When asked about the reception in um, Japan, Mike stated that there was, quote, no reaction as the film was shown in small theaters for a short theatrical run. Um, he also followed up that the Japanese audience did not really know about Audition until it got a greater reputation abroad. Um, so there was that. And then, of course, you have the... Um, you do have the home video release and all that stuff as well. Um, and probably the most recent you could get, um, because you're really not going to get like a 4k of this probably, but you'll at least get a 2k of it. Um, and you can get that from arrow video. Um, so maybe I would, maybe I would get that. That seems like it'd be fun. Um, but yeah, you're not going to get something like super high def or anything with this. Um, but that's just, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> As I stated already, I talked about like the critical response of the movie. I already talked about what you know Rotten Tomatoes as a consensus says, um, but I'll also talk a little bit about what some other critics have said. Um, so Ken Eisner of Variety gave this a positive review. Um, he referred to the film as a quote truly shocking horror film that was made even more disturbing by its haunting beauty. Uh, Jeffrey McNabb, writing in Sight and Sound, referred to the film as a quote. Uh, slow burning but ultimately devastating horror pick and wrote that it quote is a virtuoso piece of filmmaking with much more subtlety and depth than Mike's other films. The Hollywood Reporter's um, Frank Sheck uh, described the film as, uh, quote, one of the auda most audacious, iconoclastic horror films in recent years. And Mark Schilling of the Japan Times praised Sheena um, and Ishibashi's uh, acting, but noted that, quote, among the film's uh, few irritants is a smarmy, snarly bad guy turn by Ren Genji Ishibashi um, as Asami's wheelchair using ballet instructor. Um, so he's a reminder of where too many other Mike films have headed straight for the video racks. 
Schilling concluded that, um, quote, Mike is ready for a bigger role as one of the leading Japanese directors of his generation. Um, and in the early 2010s, uh, Time Out conducted a poll with several authors, directors, actors, and critics who have worked within the horror genre to vote um, for their top horror films. And Audition placed at number 18 on their top 100 list. So there you go. It's fun. The final sequence has also had kind of its own thing, too. So writers for Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and Sight and Sound all emphasize the film's final scene. Um, Sheck uh, from The Hollywood Reporter wrote that, quote, Mike lulls the audience into a state of complacency with a studied, slow-moving, lately comic first half before delivering a gruesome final selection that makes Stephen King's misery look wholesome. Um, the ending was, quote, all the more shocking for the clinical way for which it was presented. Um, Eisner from Variety stated that it was only at the ending of the film that Audition, quotes, breaks out of a uh, creepfest ghetto. Um, in his essay on themes and audition, Robin Wood um, stated that most of Mike's films are disturbing for, quote, what they have to tell us about the state of contemporary civilization. They are not in the least disturbing in themselves, um, operating on some fantasy level of annihilation with, quote, comic book violence. Um, in comparison, he stated that audition is, quote, authentically disturbing and infinitely more horrifying. The first time I watched it on DVD at home, after warnings I had received, I was repeatedly tempted through the last half hour to turn it off. Wood compared the film to uh, like Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom. I don't know if I would exactly go that far, but okay. Uh, stating that the film was, quote, almost as unwatchable as the newsreels of Auschwitz, of the innocent victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Vietnam, victims of Nazi or American dehumanization. So, I don't know what we see on the fucking TV sometimes, I guess. Um, but of the film's successes with Western audiences, Mike states that he was not surprised, but that he had, quote, no idea what goes on in the minds of people in the West, and I don't pretend to know what their tastes are, and I don't want to start thinking about that. It's nice that they liked my movie, but I'm not going to start deliberately worrying about why or what I can do to make it happen again. Again. And I like that actually. I think that's uh, very well said. Takashi Mike King. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, Aihi Shina um, Asami stated that in Japan, only a certain type of film fan would watch Audition. By comparison, she said, the film was seen by so many more people overseas, which she attributed to good timing. And so, a little bit about like the. I guess aftermath of this movie as well. Um, we'll talk about the themes probably after that. Um, but yeah, I think that this definitely influenced what would then end up becoming torture porn, quote unquote. Um, uh, for those who don't know, I guess torture porn is this kind of, um, it's this subgenre, I guess, of horror films, especially in the early two thousands, um, that, really were kind of these um it definitely focused on this kind of gratuitous violence but also throwing in a little bit of like blood gore nudity stuff like that so movies like the saw franchise um even to a point like um i don't even know if i a lot of the stuff that Eli Roth did, to be honest, Hostile, Hostile 2, I'd even put Cabin Fever in there a little bit, but I could even put a little bit into, like, the Texas Chainsaw remake, you know what I mean? Like, and a couple of other things as well, um, because, again, it seemed like it was so gratuitous. I think that's why they called it torture porn. Um the whole idea of that pornography is just gratuitously sexual, um, I think really kind of lended <laughs> torture porn to be like, you know, it's overly and gratuitously violent. Um, yeah. So uh, the term was invented by David Edelstein to describe films like, like I said, Saw, The Devil's Rejects, Wolf Creek, that offered, quote, titillating and shocking scenes that pushed the audience to the margins of depravity in order for them to, quote, feel something. This also was 
was be also because, um, you know, at this time, because history, you know, is a big part of horror and kind of what's going on at the time and the fears of the collective. Um, we were also in the middle of a literal war and seeing it on our TV uh, after having a whole, you know, act of terrorism that killed many, many people. So I feel like that also lended itself to the torture porn kind of thing going on. Um, Audition has influenced, like I said, Eli Roth. Um, he Roth has even stated that uh, Audition audition influenced him to make his film hostile um and actually takashi Miike is in hostile um in a little cameo um but richard corliss uh for time magazine um ob- optioned or opinioned that audition was different from torture porn which i do agree um because quote unlike saw and its imitators in the genre of torture porn audition doesn't go for gorific uh, money shots Mike's films uh live inside their characters taking the temperature of their longings um the ridiculous ambitions that they chase so obsessively and their need to experience the extreme to prove they're alive um, and yeah, so this has been referenced in Western pop culture, like in comic books, movies. Um, it was listed as the Soska Sisters is one of their favorite movies. Um, and the sister says that it was an influence on American Mary. Um, the directors had noted that the character of Asami, uh, stating that a audience generally sees, quote, female victims are female characters in a horror film as the helpless victim. Uh, this film leads you in one direction, skillfully hinting at a darker storyline for the otherwise meek and slight Asami until the last 15 minutes where we are introduced to a merciless monster, a perfect personification of the irrational rage of a woman scorned. And then of course, Quentin Tarantino includes audition, um, as one of his top 20 films uh, released since 1992, uh, the year he became a director, uh, referring it as to a, a, quote, true masterpiece, if there ever was one. And, um, yeah, they've talked about maybe trying to do an English version of this, which I would not welcome at all. Um, I think that'd be so weird and dumb, to be honest with you. I would not really be interested in any of that. Um but yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about just some of the, I guess, themes of this movie, too. So critics have considered Audition as both feminist and also misogynistic. Mike has stated that when he meets journalists in the United Kingdom and in France, he finds that um, they committed on the... Um, they committed on the film's feminist theories or feminist themes um, when Asami gets revenge on the men in her life. The film sets up uh, Aoyama with traits and behaviors which would be considered sexist, a list of criteria for his bride to meet, and also the phony audition format he uses to search for his future wife. So Tom Mess of... Um, the author of Agitator, the cinema of Takashi Miike, um, stated that the torture sequence with the mutilation of Aoyama um, can be seen as revenge for Asami. Uh, Dennis Lim of the Los Angeles Times uh, examined similar themes, noting that the film is, quote, ultimately about the male fear of women and female sexuality, and that women are blatantly objectified in the first half of the film only for to have Asami quote redress his, this imbalance in the second half where she becomes an avenging angel um chris bazello who writes for the uh, american cinematographer uh stated that one plausible approach to interpreting the film um is to see the final act as a representation of aoyama's guilt um, and his mistreatment of women and his desire to dominate them aoyama he develops a her paranoid fantasy of uh, an attacking object because he harbors sadistic thoughts towards women. Um, he develops a fear that the object will retaliate. Contrary to this, Mike has stated that the final torture scenes in the film are not a paranoid nightmare um, dreamed up by Aoyama. Um, Tom Mess has argued against the feminist portrayal of this film, noting that Asami is not motivated by an ideological um, agenda and that acknowledging that she takes revenge on a man who has lied to her would be ignoring that she also lied to Aoyama. Um, Asami states, quote, I want to tell you everything during the torture scene, implying that she has not been truthful before. Uh, Mess also uh, notes that the avenging angel theme contradicts um, 
a feminist themed um, revenge narrative, given that one of Asami's victims is female. Um, and in audition, um, which we could, I, I didn't dive too deep into the book, but Asami is the victim of child abuse. Um, maybe not, you know, it could also be child sexual abuse, you know, childhood sexual abuse, but like, you know, I don't know if it's really that uh, blatant, but uh, Colette Bailman of, uh, in her book, Introduction to Japanese Horror Films, um, described Asami as, quote, just one more face in the wronged women in Japanese culture. They are victims of repression and oppression, and only death and loneliness remain for them. Um, Robin Wood wrote that um, through her child abuse, though, um, Asami is taught that love and pain must be inseparable, and the audience is led to identify with Asami through this victimization, and also what Stephen LeDrew described as a, quote, patriarchal uh, you know, Japanese society and how she moves through, through that pretty much. Um, also Elvis Mitchell of the New York times has stated that the fil- theme of the film was quote, the objectification of women in Japanese society and the mirror image horror of retribution. It could create Thomas also suggests that these themes um, can be witnessed in the scene where Asami feeds her mutilated pr- uh, prisoner and then turns into the child, hood version of herself and pets him like a dog. Um, but Thomas concludes that this is done to suggest that what has happened in Asami's life has made her the violent adult that is seen in this film. Um, but yeah, you could dig into a lot of that kind of stuff and you could definitely dig into, you know, why is Asami the way she is? Um, but you know, we'll, we'll kind of get into all that, but We'll, we'll go over like a baseline of what this plot is about. So pretty much, um, if you couldn't gather some of the stuff, I'll, I'll lay it out now. So, um, Aoyama, I'm not going to say the full names of all these people, but Aoyama, um, Shigeharu Aoyama, um, so the main dude in this movie, uh, he's a widower. Um, his wife died uh, of cancer. His uh, son, Shige, um, says that he should find a new wife. Um, so this movie takes place seven years in the past. We see uh, Ryo Aoyama, um, his wife, die in the hospital. We see the little boy, Shige, um, you know, bring her, bring like a model or something that he's made um, into the room as she dies, and that all happens. So then we fast forward years and years later, um, where these two guys are fishing together and you know all that and uh shige is now a teenager and then ayama is just like an older guy now um at least seven years older than i guess he was um anyway but yeah his son like says he should find a new wife because you look lonely um so yoshikawa who is um boss tanaka um a film producer uh because i don't really know what Ayoyama does for work. I know he works in a office. I guess he works in like documentary film or something like that, but I didn't quite get that. But anyway, so, um, but his friend, this film producer, he devises a mock, uh, casting audition, um, for, uh, the part of, he auditions them for a movie that technically is like being, you floated around, but I don't think the movie is actually going to get made really, but really uh, they're using this audition as kind of a front to try to see if they could find a person to be, uh, you know, Aoyama's new wife or whatever, or new boo thing pretty much. Uh, and so during this whole process, because he takes, you know, the headshots and like little resumes home and stuff. And he is, uh, Aoyama is really taken with one of the applicants named Asami, uh, Yamakaze, uh, Yamazaki. Yes. Uh, like I said, these are going to kick my ass, but, uh, yeah. So, the thing is, though, is that Yoshikawa um, cannot reach any of the references that are on Asami's resume, though, um, such as like a music producer that she said she worked for who went missing. Um, and even during the audition, when he, you could tell that Aoyama is like so into her, um, but like, you know, uh, even his friend is like, there's something up with her. There's something weird about her. I don't know if I trust her. Uh, 
But yeah, anyway, so uh, Aoyama, though, is so enthralled with her that he literally just pursues her anyway. Like, he's really into her and really about her, right? So she lives in, like, a little a tiny apartment um, containing uh, little besides a large sack and a phone that you see. Um, and so for four days after the audition, she sits perfectly still next to the phone waiting for it to ring. Because that's what you had to do back in the day. Um, and so uh, when it finally does happen, she answers, pretending that she never expected uh, for Ayoyama to call her back um and um after several dates though she accompanies him to a seaside hotel uh where you know he he intends to propose marriage to her um and she reveals burn scars on her body um and before having sex with her him um demands that um he pretty much pledge his love to her and that she will only um receive his love and he won't love anybody else uh, deeply moved, he agrees, and in the morning, Asami is then nowhere to be found. Now, also keep in mind that uh, at this point as well, um, Ayama has not told Asami that he is a widower, so he has a um, he has you know a, a dead wife, pretty much. But also, he doesn't tell her that he also has like a kid, like a teenage kid. Um, so. You know, you'll, we'll see about that. But, uh, so Aoyama tries to track her down, but as, um, you know, his friend warned, all of the contacts on her, um, resume are dead ends. Um, and at the dance studio where she's trained, um, he finds a man with prosthetic feet, um, who had tortured Asami when she was a kid, um, causing her burn scars. And the bar that she had worked, um, for, that she said she worked for like three times a week or something, um, has been abandoned for a year following the murder and dismemberment of the owner who was a female um and so when the police found all of this they actually found three extra fingers an extra ear and an extra tongue when they had actually recovered the body and of course um this guy is having like uh hallucinations of these different body parts um as well but then what ends up happening is that uh, Asami goes to Aoyama's house um, because nobody's fucking there, I guess. Um, she doesn't kill the, like, the you see a housekeeper come through every so often. And he, she, she doesn't kill her, which I guess is good. She doesn't kill women. You know, she did kill a woman, but she doesn't kill the housekeeper or anything. Anyway, but she finds out that um, he had his late wife and also that she, he has a kid. Um, but in rage, she drugs his liquor um, and uh, Aoyama comes home, pours a drink and is drugged. Uh, and a flashback shows that uh, the sack in Asami's apartment that we saw earlier um, contains a man who is missing both of his feet his tongue one ear and three fingers on one hand he then crawls out and begs for food and asami in the background is vomiting into a dog dish and then he uh the, the guy who was in the bag decides to consume it and it's really fucking gross for those who could not deal with that kind of thing i myself though am somebody who is devoid of any sort of like i'm so desensitized so it didn't mean that much to me, but please, please be aware of that if you're going to watch this. Okay? It's kind of gross. Anyway, so uh, this guy is knocked the fuck out, right? And whatever. And he's on his floor. And uh, Asami injects Aoyama with a paralytic agent that leaves his nerves alert, but he himself is kind of paralyzed. And she tortures him with needles. She tells him that, um, just like everyone else, he has failed to love only her. She cannot tolerate his feelings for anybody else, even his own son. And she inserts uh, needles below his eyes and cuts off his left foot with a wire saw, um, like the one you see in Hereditary or in Saw 10, apparently. I have not seen Saw 10, but that's what I heard. Um, Shige actually returns home and Asami attacks the boy. Um, and Shige, uh, well, what happens is that Aoyama, he uh, appears to suddenly wake up back in the hotel that they were at when they were, you know, doing it and having sex. Um, 
his current ordeal seeming to be only a nightmare. He proposes marriage to Asami and she accepts. And as he falls back asleep, he is then returned to reality. Uh, his previous awakening was false uh, to find his son fighting Asami. Um, what happens pretty much is that Shige uh, kicks her down the stairs, just like fucking punts her. And um, she falls down the stairs, uh, breaking her neck. And. Uh, Aoyama tells his son to call the cops and stares at the dying Asami, who repeats what she had said on one of their dates uh, about her excitement on seeing him again. And then you close the film. So, yeah, that's like the, the plot of this film. But yeah, this movie is fucking insane. <laughs> um, you know, I uh, there's so much to it. Oh, my God. Um, I will say that, I mean... Yeah, this movie does start out as like, yeah, like it, it starts off as this like drama, really, because you see that this guy is like, you know, he is, he, he wants to uh, get back out there after being a widower for quite a few years and helping and really raising his son on his own, but then like for whatever reason, you know his friend feels like, you know, well, let's make it easy and try to do this audition, right? And I just think that that's just obviously horrible and terrible. Um, you know, don't just set up an audition to try to find a girlfriend. Um, that's really fucked up, actually, especially for these people who are, you know, already kind of having to, uh, you know, put their, you know, they're putting their lives on the line and they're putting their, um, yeah, this is their livelihood. It's the, a lot of these people are actors, models, things like that, you know, and they're trying to get a job, you know, they're trying to get employment and they're not, they're not, th this is not a real audition. Like this is not something that'll actually make the money. You know what I mean? So it's kind of fucked up, but, but yeah, like, it, but it, it, it's one of these things where it's just, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for, what Aoyama kind of does in this movie. Um, really, I think with him more so, if anything, like I think his friend, um, Yoshikawa, he's a little bit more despicable, which is interesting. Cause then you don't really see him in the movie after a certain point anymore, um, which makes total sense. Cause the movie is not about him, but um, yeah, I just, uh, he always just felt a little, you know, kind of skeezier to me if anything um when it comes to this film uh but there was there was that for sure but yeah i but i think with aoyama at least he he comes from a different generation obviously and maybe he has these ideas of what women you know should be like or you know because he was in a long-term relationship you know and he he was in a different generation when he got into that marriage obviously you know um he's only kind of seen it you know one particular way right like of how he would have been raised by his parents and then how he you know, was with his first wife and all of this. We don't really know what their relationship was like, obviously, because literally the wife dies in the beginning. But, you know, it, but it's now been that, like, he has been, he hasn't been around um, the dating culture. And that, I think, can speak to a fair amount of people. Um, you know, especially when you, for whatever reason, whether it was that you decided to break up, divorce, whatever, and or, you know, you had a partner die, you know, it's hard for somebody to go back out there and, and try to and try their luck in the dating world. Um, and only imagine this is 1999 in Japan, which is a whole different thing. Um, and now nowadays with, you know, Tinder and Bumble and like all these things, like, I mean, it's fucking hell out there. You know what I mean? So it's it's uh I don't know. I think if anything, Ioyama, I do not, uh, I don't think he, uh, is the best guy. I think he's very, fairly complicit. I feel like, um, however, I will say, I don't think he like completely deserves his fate. Um, he doesn't deserve to get his foot cut off, you know? Um, but I, if anything, I find him complicit, if anything, because he's going along with this audition and, you know, like, uh, whatever. But it's also really interesting because, like, this movie is very much like a 
be careful who you let into your life too, because he had this idealized thought of Asami really. And I mean, she's gorgeous, of course, like she, you know, beautiful, but like, you don't know somebody. And, and I think also just like his sort of laser focus in on her, right? Like, um, you're, you're struck by her beauty, you know, which makes sense. But like, there's not, you don't know this person. You really don't. And it's, it, you gotta be careful. And, uh, I always, I think that's also an interesting thing they do with this as well is that, you know, I don't, I don't really know if there had been a ton of other movies, especially that kind of talked about that or, or really showed that where it's like, this woman is the villain of the piece, you know, and she is the, the big bad, if you will. So I don't know. It's, but yeah, if anything, I didn't, I didn't hate Aoyama or anything. Um, is he misogynistic? Maybe a tiny, maybe a little bit. Sure. But I think if anything, he's complicit really. And I, I don't, I don't know. He, he didn't, I don't think he completely deserved his like fate of getting like his fucking foot cut off and, you know, uh, needles in his like, you know, needles all over him and shit. But like, if anything, like, uh, yeah, I think he was just lonely if anything. And he wanted to try to see what else was, was out there. If anything. Um, so that's kind of my thought on, on, Aoyama as a character. There isn't much to say about his son. Um, if anything, his son, I can sort of relate just because like, not that my mother passed away like that, but like my dad passed away when I was younger. Um, and so I've, I've seen it where I've had a parent, you know, die earlier in my life and how that can be hard on off a family, depending on the relationship that you had with them. But like, you know, I, if anything, like I, I can see where Shige is, you know, he just wants to see his dad happy maybe. And maybe he's seeing that, you know, he's just kind of doing his job. He's going to work, you know, he's doing whatever, but like, he's not necessarily, maybe he doesn't look the happiest or, or he wants his dad to hopefully have happiness. And that's why he says like, you know, you should, you should try to get married again, you know, and, and all that, but there isn't much to him. Cause we don't see she really throughout. Um, he does say some stuff about being scared by women in a way, which listen, women can be scary, man. They just can be. I, I grew up with my mom and my sister. So, you know, they're lovely, but like, I mean, no, there's a, a an intensity, you know, that uh, some women can have. Um, I also have it too. So it's like, you know, maybe there's just an intensity to people sometimes, but you know, I, I definitely, uh, there's a level of, uh, you know, I don't know. And then plus also like he only had so much with his mom. So it's not like he's had like this other, he's only had his dad, you know, for the longest time. So it's, you know, I also love how his, um, I love his little like friend that he has like his, uh, perspective, little girlfriend. I thought she was super cute, which is also interesting because, in like the whatever the fuck the dream is or like whatever where he ends up in Asami's apartment you see that uh Asami is there and he's going to like give him oral sex but then he turns she turns into uh I don't remember her name but it was his secretary at work cuz I guess they fucked before or whatever and then it turns into this little this uh teenage girl who his his uh son had been like um had like brought over to the house and like whatever blah blah, blah. but yeah um and I was like, wait, oh my god, why is why is she there? Is it because like a is it because Aoyama was like somehow interested in his like his son's like little girlfriend that he was trying to have? Like, I don't even fucking know, man. Uh but yeah, that was that was kind of odd, a little weird. Um I forgot to mention that, but yeah, I, I thought that was a very weird. But yeah, there isn't much to say about Shige, though, like, truly, honestly, because he's not really a big part of the movie, to be perfectly honest. Um, and Yoshikawa, like, he's not the hugest part of the movie either. Again, I always thought he was a little bit more, like, skeezy um, than anything, but really, he he's not, like, a huge part of the plot, really. With Asami, though, listen, listen, um, murder is bad. It's horrible. 
it really is. Um, but I will say, I really... Asami is so fascinating to me um, because she really is somebody who... I just love her, like, energy, you know? She is such a... Uh, such an interesting character to me because she is strikingly gorgeous and beautiful and all of these things, right? But also, like, you really don't know anything about her except that she's been abused. Uh, you see that throughout the movie. You see that that is a, a, an unfortunate part of her life that, you know, she's experienced. But really, I think... In order to cope with that, I guess, I think she's had to, like, kind of create this persona or she's had to kind of create this personality for herself. Um, and I don't like I don't know. It, it's this is such a um, sh- it, Asami definitely uh, it belongs in the house of psychotic women. You know what I mean? Uh, to, to me, because she is uh, definitely like I I love her as this kind of psychopathic woman um, because she is somebody who starts off and she's this gorgeous lady. And, you know, you you think like, OK, like, you know, cool. Like she seems like well read and like all of these things. But also by the end of everything like you can also be like what if she was just like making everything up (laughs) what if she was just like bullshitting him the whole time you know what i mean um because maybe that's what she's had to do you know she's had to kind of put this wall up in a way um and she really she just wants that one person to give her that love and devotion that she has not gotten. Um, mostly because I don't think she's experienced it or, or if she has had that at all, um, it's not to her liking, you know, it's not to what she would want. So Asami is a very fascinating character to me. And, you know, I do think like, yeah, there is this like level of female rage that she has, but you don't see it until the end. And it's also not like, uh, it's not like rage as like, you know, Hulk smash rage. Right. I, I think it's more just like this quiet, intense rage, which I really can get into. Um, but that's what I think is really fascinating about, about Asami as a character is that, you know, um, she is this particular type of woman, um, and kind of mild mannered and, you know, all of these things and she still stays a little bit that way but the way that she plays this psychopathy you know um i think it's just really really cool um because yes no she absolutely is a uh she is clinically insane like she is somebody who is very obsessive and it is you know yeah like she's done some she killed a dog for god's sakes you know like she uh she's killed people before she has dismembered some uh, you know some people's body parts like you know it's a whole thing and so but i really i really fuck with uh i fuck with asami honestly i will also say i loved the muppet coat God damn, I love that Muppet coat. It's a really cute, like, red Muppet coat that she wears. Um, I mean, girl, I want one so bad. But anyway, so... <laughs> but yeah, I mean... I, I think, if anything, I like uh, this portrayal of this this kind of uh, psychotic woman. And I'm, I'm so, so here for it. I think any sort of particular scenes that kind of stand out to me in this film, of course, I also think like the audition scene was a huge one um, because you just kind of see these different women and it feels so weird because it really is this like audition because they're filming them and they're asking them all these like weird ass things. Um, One lady just takes her top off and like shows her titties. That's a whole thing too. But like, it's, it's just like, you know, 
it's like one weird date after another, which is just very odd to think about when you think of just the audition process in general for actors and stuff like that. So it's very odd. But uh, but it's definitely kind of um, like one lady like had a, like a, an attempt of suicide and she kind of talked a little bit about that. And like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like it's these different hopefuls that are trying to just secure a job. Like they're just trying to get a gig and little do they know they ain't going to get a gig. You know, it's not going to happen. But I would say that the audition scene as a whole, I think, is really just fascinating and interesting. Um, I do like the scene where like uh, Shige brings his little girlfriend home and um, like the little girlfriend meets like Ayayama is, is kind of interesting to see as well. Um, I, I always thought that was kind of, you know, just their little exchange was kind of cute. But again, it is also weird because I'm like, was there kind of this like subconscious thing in Ayayama's head where like he was somehow attracted to this like supposed teenage girl? Uh, that gets a little weird to me, but you know, whatever. Uh, I don't even know if the movie was going deep like that, but you know, <laughs> there's that. And I think also just looking for a Sami and him doing his own investigation of that, I thought was also very interesting. Um, and trying to find out more about her. Um, and even when he goes to the dance studio and he finds this guy with like no feet playing the piano and shit like that. Um, and he's even telling him like, you know, the guy is telling him like, you know, don't even worry about her. Like you should run when you got a chance. Um, which is sort of darkly funny because you're like, well, this guy can't run cause he doesn't have real feet, but you know, it's like a whole thing. But, and then of course also to, um, the, I mean, it's kind of needless to say, like the last torture scene of this movie where, you know, uh, Aoyama is drugged and he is, uh, tortured by Asami with these acupuncture needles with getting his foot sawed off um, and all of these things. I mean, it is very, I mean, we're so I, as a horror fan have just been very desensitized to things. Um, but I definitely think that this is still an affecting um, scene for sure. Um, it's that. And then also like the scene in, in Asami's apartment that they have is always very interesting. The one where the guy, the guy in the bag is like licking up her vomit. Like that's really gross. But like the final, final scene, um, truly is just iconic. Like it's just her Asami showing just how crazy she is. Um, and just how like, you know, um, kind of devoted she is and she really just wants somebody to love her um and nobody's been able to do that really and um i don't know it's just it's uh yeah and then also just the whole thing of like how it's interesting because then shige comes home at the end and he's the one who ends up technically killing asami really but like it's funny because like all of this kind of started in a weird way. All of this started because Shige, like, you know, he suggested that his dad look for a new wife, you know, it's like, it's just interesting to me that like the start of this film does start with that. And then at the end of the film, Shige is the one who actually ends up killing Asami. Um, but he kind of started it a little bit. You know, he kind of put that nugget in his dad's head, you know? So I, I thought that was really, I thought that was so interesting. I just thought that was like, you know, now that I think about it, it's just like, hmm. But this kind of started from you, didn't it, dude? I mean, it sort of did. So, you know that is what that is, you know, but yeah, I really do like the, I really do like the, the, uh, 
I really do like the end scene personally, and I, I think it is uh, iconic for what it is. Just her and her like um, black leather, like uh, s- like smock thing, and her like white shirt that she has on, and you know her doing the little you know kitty 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 kitty, you know a little deeper deeper thing, and um, yeah, and all of her stuff is so like all of her weapons are very. It's not a fucking axe and hatchet and like all this shit right it's like the syringe with the paralytic agent and then you have these needles that she's like digging into these different parts of his body and then you have the wire saw it's very delicate stuff which is very interesting to me um yeah talking about like you know this female killer um i I always just thought that was really cool and it's just interesting that she has those kind of delicate quote unquote weapons, uh, in her arsenal. But, you know, I think this, this movie is just, um, yeah. And I think this movie is just so to wrap up a little bit of my thoughts on it, cause there isn't really much else I can talk about with it. I've already talked about like what I think of the characters, just what I think of, the, the movie in general and just some of the movie, you know, the scenes in it and, and all that. Uh, for me, at least, like, this movie is something where it obviously is not for everybody. Um, unless you're interested in this kind of, like, uh, I guess disturbing horror, if you will. Although not all of it is disturbing, though. So, um, Takashi Miike is already kind of, he has that sort of thing anyway. But, like, Audition's actually kind of when it comes to some of his other stuff but like uh, audition still a a pretty pretty decent piece though but like i think if anything that this movie is definitely a um worth a watch for anybody interested in um you know japanese horror or anything um if you haven't seen it definitely give it a watch it lives on um to be every so often it does come on there every so often and then also, um, like I said, Canopy, like you may be able to find it on there. Um, but I, I definitely really recommend it personally, um, for anybody who might be interested in that kind of like, uh, <laughs> a little bit of extreme horror, if you will, um, getting into that, uh, it can be very unsettling in that point i think my criticism mainly of the movie like i said earlier um would be that i wish it wasn't as long as it was but i you know it wasn't the worst thing in the world but i just wish it was cut down just a little bit um you know but i do think the the end of it does pay off in a way which is cool um so then i can kind of be okay with like having a little bit of a longer movie that i feel like could have been cut a little bit but you know it is what it is but I really do like Audition quite a bit, and I think it is one of my favorite Japanese horror movies, um, me personally at least. Um, I, I really, if for nothing else, like I really just like Asami and kind of watching her and her story. Um, you know, it's it's Asami's world, and we're just all living in it, really. Um, but yeah, I I just think this is such a you know it's such an interesting movie and I think that it kind of then set into motion the rest of what Takashi Miike would do in his career, which is cool to me. Um, and I, uh, you know, the guy is still working. I think even to today, like I think he's still doing some shit. So that's cool. Um, and I think if anything, he is noted as like, I, I, I don't know how much I would say prolific. I feel like it could be thrown in there um, because he's just worked so much in that industry. Um, and especially in the horror realm, I think he's definitely prolific um, because of something like Audition, but also some of his other movies as well. Um, and he just, yeah, he's he's got that niche uh, down pat for sure. Uh, but yeah, but I would definitely give Audition a watch if you're uh, maybe looking for something new in horror and you kind of want to push yourself. I, I can always give that recommendation for sure. Uh, it's a really interesting film. And um, yeah, pull up on more international movies. I, I love a good international movie. Um, J-Horror is one of like kind of my faves where I just like 
different J horror movies, you know? So, uh, I'm always on the lookout for, for some good stuff to watch. Um, and I think audition is a great way of kind of starting that. If maybe you're a newbie and you're kind of interested in dipping your toe into it, like just to see, you know, if this, uh, if it interests you really, but I think that's as much as I can really say about audition currently. Um, but yeah, go watch it. It's celebrating 25 years. So hopefully there will be, you know, um, any sort of think pieces or people writing about it or, um, more attention put on it in some way. Um, and that's what I'm, that's my hope at least, but I really do like this and I think it's definitely worth a watch and, uh, you know, I think if anything, like, um, I, I think if anything, like it is worth the watch. Um, don't be too scared about it being too intense for you. I guess, you know, watch at your own risk, I guess, know yourself, um, and know your limits. But I do think this is such a, a good little movie to check out. So for sure. And I think that's everything for our episode on audition. But um, as always, thank you so much for listening to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. Um, for those who want to follow the show on social media, you can do so. Um, you can follow the show on Instagram at Cult Cinema Circle. Um, on there, I post you know what I'll be covering for the week, uh, and also just like I'll post like stories about like you know what I've been watching, or just like fun little clips or like whatever the fuck shit i want to post um you can also follow the show on twitter uh, at cult cine circle and then also you can follow me on letterboxd at jesse j-e-s-s-e kremp k-r-e-m-p all one word or look up cult cinema circle i guess you could do that too and i'll you'll find me and i post on there like what i've watched and like i'll post little movie reviews and you know i just yeah, kind of stalk people and their little you know profiles and see what they've watched uh you know not stock like a Sami stalking, but you know, just like see what people are doing, you know, just browse. Um, so yeah, good times, fun. Uh, you can also email me, uh, at cult cinema circle at gmail.com. If you just want to like say hi, give feedback on the show, or if you want to give any movie recommendations, you want to come on, be a guest, whatever, you know, I'm, all, I'm into all of it. Um, why not? <laughs> And also, please, you know, for anybody listening to me on, you know, uh, your podcatcher of choice, whether that be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, whatever, please, you know, rate, comment, subscribe, um, you know, give me a five star review, one to you know, five stars review, all that good stuff. Um, you know, it gets people to see the show more and, you know, gets my name out there more, I guess, which is cool. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely would appreciate all that um and yeah so that's all about the social media plugs now for next week what i'm planning on doing is uh you know i'm gonna be covering a little movie uh not from 1999 thankfully now um but it's actually from 1979 and we're gonna keep on the horror train a little bit but next week uh i plan to cover a little movie um called phantasm now uh i would go into this blind personally um this is a movie like i said from 1979 um it's about two brothers. Uh, really, it's about like one of the younger brothers, but it's about these two brothers. Uh, a guy who is known as the tall man who owns a funeral home and a bunch of crazy shit happens. <laughs> um, and it's a horror movie from the, the late 70s into the 80s. Um, it is celebrating, I guess at this point, it'd be celebrating... Uh, I guess 40 years or something like that or 45 years. I think it is. Yeah. 45 that, that I can do math. Um, but yeah, so that's super dope and cool. Um, but yeah, so that's what we're going to be covering next week. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, it is on Peacock right now. So you don't want to watch it. I think it's on there. Um, but you can find it around. You can find it on Tubi and you can find it, find it a few different places. So please, please, uh, watch, watch phantasm. If you haven't already, and um you know you can pull up for next week's episode um but as always thank you so much for taking the time
time uh, to listen to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. And uh, kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much for listening and have a great rest of your evening, night, all that. And, uh, see you in the next one. Take care. Bye. Bye.